Hey, good evening, everyone. And uh, I welcome you all. My name is uh, Simon Jacobson. That has not changed um, since we were here last week. Uh, but uh, many other things have changed. Um, you know, this year, 2011, seems to be turning out into some very dramatic year uh, on many levels. With just the recent, uh, most recent news with Osama bin Laden's um, killing. And uh, which in many ways overshadows probably all the other events. I mean, last week the biggest news was the royal wedding, if I recall. Um, and then, uh, of course, we're dealing with issues of the recession, natural disasters, the tornadoes in the south, the tsunami and earthquake in Japan. Um, so a lot of unpredictable things that are uh, shaking up the world. And when we started out 2011, I guess most, most none of this was, uh, no one had predicted any of that was coming. Um, you know, Who would have believed uh, certain unknowns when we were living in such a certain world and things seemed to be progressing so well, many things uh, reminded us. And of course, the Middle East itself, the whole new upheavals there, that's probably maybe the biggest news of all even though um, maybe not as dramatic as the killing of bin Laden, but nevertheless, it is a lasting event and that will have ripple effects and in many ways may be the shaping and defining event of the 21st century. You know, it's very hard to see the bird's eye view and perspective when you're living through experiences. You can't see the forest from the trees. So just uh, as put things into context, you know, turn the clock back 100 years ago. Now we can look at it in perspective. The year is 1911, okay, the beginning of the 20th century. And there were many breakthroughs as well. You know, this was a time where the Industrial Revolution had already peaked to the point that uh, there was dramatic changes in the context of industry, electricity, steam engine, even radio, TV was beginning to emerge. I know we look back at it like primitive, but for, the, for that time it was extremely progressive and, uh, and no one knew in 1911 what was coming. No one could predict what kind of century it would be. Remember, 1911 was still before the Russian Revolution, before World War I, before World War II, and all the havoc, the greatest wars killing more people than all of history. All that was unknown. Yes, there were seeds of dissent and festering forces, but no one knew how profound they are. Just like an eruption of a volcano, even though you know there are forces, you don't know how much it will erupt and what kind of impact it will have. And the 20th century will go down in history as the bloodiest century, as well as the most advanced century, because it also gave birth to the greatest technologies gave birth to new types of freedoms. The Jewish people gave birth to the state of Israel, gave birth to uh, a new generation that uh, after the Holocaust and after the former Soviet Union, no one would believe that today Jews can live anywhere free. So there are many, many uh, great things that have also happened. It's like a really uh, schizophrenic century in the sense of two extremes, the best and the worst. So even though Charles Dickens wrote it about... Uh, the 18th century, the French Revolution, that these are the best of times and the worst of times. It's true that you probably can say it about any time, but the 20th century for sure. So if you look at that context, in context, the question is what, are we, can look, what can we look forward to? And hopefully we do not look forward to another world, world war. But there's no question that there are forces at work now that I would su submit are probably even more powerful than 1911. First of all, 1911, we didn't have the technology that everybody knew what was going on in everyone else's uh, living room. So immediately there's a whole change that today, any, anything that happens, everyone knows about it immediately, billions of people. So that has to have an impact. It amplifies, it accelerates, uh, it empowers people. Even the Middle East, you see a lot of it is a result of people seeing what other people are doing. It gives you strength. In the olden days, a century ago, before that, tyrants could simply isolate us 
and therefore one person doesn't know of the other, you can't group together. That's almost impossible today. So, and there are forces just as powerful as then. The Middle East, you're talking about a, a, a population of 1.5 billion people, billion. It's far greater than the number of people that ever lived in Europe. So as much as we give credence to the American and French revolutions, the numbers were not even close to the numbers of the Middle East. So you're dealing with serious, serious numbers, serious descent, serious forces that erupting, no one has any way to predict what will happen. Or at least seemingly not. So I'd like to talk a little about that. And of course, in the context of bin Laden's death, because uh, beyond the euphoria that you see in the streets, whether you agree with it or don't agree in the jubilation over his killing, and you hear it on the, all the pundits and the bloggers and the commentators are all discussing it. Frankly, I find it a little like odd, you know, like is that the issue? Who really cares, you know? The bigger issues to worry about. Even if people are over-celebrating and maybe, you know, America likes to celebrate. They like parties. You know, there's New Year's parties and then there's Super Bowl parties. And it's like cowboys and Indians and now they got the, the bad guy. So there's celebration. So this is somewhat shallow in some ways. But on the other hand, September 11th also shook up the psyche of this country and New Yorkers especially. So you gotta sometimes give people slack. Fine, let them celebrate a little, a little closure, so to speak. As they say, they got him. Some justice has served. The mastermind that has killed, first of all, thousands of lives were affected by it and continue to be affected. And he really has changed our lives. Airports, security, everything we go through today, the whole constant state, state of alert that's constantly uh, affecting us is a direct result of one man, not just one man, also the people he inspired. Um, but at the same time, if you really want to be wise, you have to always look at things in the bigger picture. You know, the euphoria will die down. Uh, the, the, the moment will pass. You know, what's the context of it all? And it still remains, frankly, a big mystery to most people. Almost everyone. You know, what, did, what did Bin Laden actually want? What was his intentions? Forget about the fact that you know, we're repulsed by the idea of him killing innocent people. Obviously, that goes without saying. What did the man want? Clearly a religious person. It wasn't like a psychotic. You know, you hear usually about these shooting sprees in the United States. It comes down to a loner, a psychotic, uh, grievances, whatever it is. And here, we, we're Americans, we love uh, therapy. So we, we therapize and uh, we analyze everybody's psyche. Everybody you know, has the stuff, the reason that they suddenly became mass murderers or something. But here's a man, you know, um, who everyone, by all accounts, was gentle, was spiritual, was passionate. And it's like some switch in his mind was, however, the enemy is the Western world, the infidels. And you do everything to kill them. And everyone is game. There's no such thing as innocent or guilty. Everyone's guilty. That was his philosophy and attitude. Something hard for us to relate to, especially as I said, he's, he wasn't considered, no one ever suggested that he was uh, balanced or was mentally disturbed. He actually was quite sane, coming from a very distinguished and wealthy billionaire family in Saudi Arabia, giving up all that luxury, you know, to become notorious. He ha it has to affect somebody to have to hide. Yes, it's true, he had a million dollar compound, a multi million dollar compound, but still, he was, every day was a, he knew he was being chased. And you wonder what's in the psyche of such a person. And it's not because we're trying to justify what he did. It's just trying to understand what's going on. And, and, and is, he, is he the only one? I mean, the fact is thousands upon thousands of Muslims have blown themselves up and killed many, many innocent people. So there may be different philosophies. And Al-Qaeda has one philosophy and the Taliban another and the Arab, uh, whatever they call brotherhood another and Iran another. But, but the bottom line is that it's all coming from one world, the Middle Eastern, Muslim, Arab world. And, what, and it all has one common denominator, I mean the terrorism, which is by all means do whatever it takes to kill others to get your goals met. The question is what are these goals? So I've discussed this at length after September 11th and many other classes, but since it's all now coming back, I want to share some thoughts on this. And uh, not, just, uh, but most, not just academically, but above all, what it means to us personally. 
See, because the Torah and the Jewish perspective on things at, at the end of everything is all about, um, number one, seeing things clearly, but also identifying what our role in all of this is. And I, I, I say that intentionally because the fact is that we live in a world which, is, as it gets increasingly accelerated technologies, it also decelerated increasingly the, uh, our personal connection to each other and to the world around us. Because technology by nature is depersonalized. It depersonalizes us. In many ways, it makes us insignificant. You know, what is one person in face of six billion people? Almost seven billion, they say, in a few years. It's a billion. It's hard even to fathom that number. What difference does it really make, what you do, what you don't do? So with all the advancements of technology and standard of living, the individual has become very marginalized. Do we really make a difference? And uh, yeah, we make a difference to maybe our own families and our close ones and to ourselves. But that's a very small circle. That doesn't have any cosmic impact. So at the same time that the Torah teaches us how to look at things with clear eyes and with perspective, stepping back and looking at the big picture, it also brings it back to the small picture, which is who we are individually and what this means to us, and what role we, we play or don't play. And that's really what makes it extremely, uh, I could say, exciting, because there is a drama unfolding, and the drama is, and we are part of that drama. We, are, we help write that script. It's not just their predestined script written by God, and we're puppets that play out, um, that, play out that script, but we make a difference. And our contribution, or lack thereof, changes the destiny of things. And besides that being an empowering message, it's also a vital one because it really comes down to what do, what do we do with our lives? I mean, all this is very interesting. People following bin Laden's manhunt, all the details of how they got him. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's like a movie, okay? So now we got him, and we know all the details, but what is that? So what? Okay, it's true you put away a person who cannot create, wreak more havoc. But no one's any, you don't have to be uh, brilliant to understand that uh, it's not the end of, the, of terror or the end of, of uh, fear and so on. Again, I'm not minimizing what happened. He was symbolic and he was, became the face of terror. And there's no question, it, it, it's a deterrent when others see, you know, you keep hunting down. But there's still, it's almost like a machine, some type of breeding ground going on there that for every one, it's killed, another thousand or hundred rise. We don't even know the numbers, to be very honest. And then when you hear that he li was living six years in a compound, right in the middle of a city, just a, few, a third of a mile away from an army uh, base, not in some uh, forlorn wilderness cave in Afghanistan. Everyone thought he was in one cave or another. You know, which gives us the impression that he's living like with a, with a, with a, uh, with a little candle, a cave with a few uh, skins, and he grunts at night or something, you know? Living in a c compound. Uh, so what does it tell you? And no one knew about it? I mean, so besides it was the public declarations deploring bin Laden and his ilk, the question is, push comes to shove. Is the Muslim world for the West? Do they prefer bin Laden or the Western world? I think anyone knows that's not such a simple question to answer. I'm not talking about the people in power who are in bed with the money and the oil and stuff like that. I'm talking about the masses. The masses who go and pray five times a day and listen to the sermons in the mosques that, teach, that, that, that preach a certain message. Who, they, who, who is their heart? You think their heart is with the Western world? I'm not suggesting by no means in any blanket statement way that we're dealing with just everybody is just uh, violent and killers and suicide bombers. But there's a philosophy they identify more with bin Laden's philosophy than they do with ours. They would say that we stop at violence. We agree with his philosophy, but the methods used were somewhat um, uh, were wild. That's what many, many, what we call moderate Muslims would say. But the philosophy, the idea that Islam is the superior religion that is going to redeem the world, this is a basic belief of every Muslim. And the question is, how far you go? As I say, I have no question that many will say absolutely not violence and not um, killing others and so on and so forth. But 
what, are we offering them alternative philosophy? What's our alternative philosophy? Uh, bring a McDonald's into your, play, into your cities and some Apple computers and a little uh, sitcoms from uh, the United States TV and you'll become just like us. That is, uh, in a way, the marketers of America would like that. But you know, you're competing here with passionate faith. Passionate faith is a very powerful force. You're not going to eliminate that with, um, with a mediocre or complacent type of indulgence of the Western world. And I come from the Western world myself, so I understand. So I also just don't kill us, and we become, you become our enemy by killing us. But what alternative philosophy? If you were to have an opportunity to sit with bin Laden, uh, let's just say he would allow it and you would allow it, and there'd be no violence, what would you tell him? What would the conversation be like? Besides, don't kill us, and so on. Would you be able to philosophically communicate with him? Would you be able to touch him someplace? And do you think that the people being inspired by him and by his teachers um, are just all idiots? They're all just, as I said, they're not guys that you pull out of prison and they send them off in suicide bombs. There are many of them are highly educated. Some of them come from very wealthy homes and families. And, but their whole mindset is different than our own. Now, if you're a fundamentalist Jew who's like a fanatic religious person, maybe you can identify a bit with them. Because you see, unfortunately, and I don't like to compare apples and oranges, it's more than that because Jews in general do not uh, bomb anyone. Infidels as well. I mean, you may have one or two crackpots. But generally speaking, the worst you'll find is someone throwing stones at a car driving on Shabbat in Jerusalem. I'm not suggesting that, it isn't, that it's acceptable, but it's, it, that's why I just don't want to compare it to blowing up the World Trade Center. But, the, the, but philosophically, yes, you could see someone who is very committed to God being not able to tolerate anyone that is not and using methods that some, most of us would consider, um, I, don't want to, what's a, what's a, I don't want to say not cordial, it's a little stronger than that, a little aggressive methods. And let's take it back to ourselves. What about each of us? What do you do when you don't tolerate somebody that disagrees with you? Are we all like perfectly docile creatures and coexistence and we're so secure? So again, I don't want to compare it because it's like how could you compare somebody who, let's say, gets, uh, uh, throws a tantrum or gets angry and yells at someone because they disagree to Bin Laden who was responsible for killing thousands and thousands of people. I'm not comparing it at the moment. But conceptually on a subtle level, on some microcosmic level, there is, a, there, is, there is a similarity. How do we educate our children? And how do we speak to each other? How do you balance coexistence with someone that disagrees with you without compromising your own values? Let's put it that way. So, so given Bin Laden's approach and Al-Qaeda and many that are similar philosophies, the approach there that is you kill them. That's how you do it. We'll all agree that that's not an approach. So what is the approach? The other extreme is just, what's the word for it, um, pluralism. We tolerate everything. You know, no values at all. Which is like the other extreme, which is also in America, it's uh, one of the problems. There's no values, so that way you never fight because nobody stands for anything. Is that really the acceptable alternative? Is there an in-between place? And surprisingly, the in-between place is actually stated clearly in the Torah is the whole purpose of the Torah came to achieve this in-between place. Maimonides puts it this way at the end of the laws of Hanukkah. He says, he talks about, if you have, only enough, if you have, only, have enough money only to buy one candle and it's Shabbos and Hanukkah, so what do, you, what do you use the candle for? Lighting Hanukkah or are you lighting the Shabbos candles? In other words, what blessing do you make? What mitzvah do you perform? So you would think that, the, that uh, the logic would dictate, as it says in the Talmud, there are two, di uh, two opinions on matters of this nature. Tadr ve'ena tadr, when something is a consistent thing you do every week, let's say, and something you do only once a year, which one takes precedent? So there's an argument, there's a disagreement. One would say the thing that is uh, less common takes precedent. Hanukkah happens only once a year, Shabbos is every week. So if you only can do one, do the mitzvah that has a novelty. Next week you'll always be able to light a Shabbos candle. But then there's another opinion that the thing that is consistent, Shabbos every week, takes precedent. That's why it's consistent. It has a certain uh, has a priority. 
But Maimonides, uh, citing from the Talmud, actually answers that it's Shabbos, but for a different reason, not because it's steady. Because Shabbos introduces Shalom Bayit. The flames of Shabbos, when you light Shabbos candles, it says it adds, it brings peace into the home. Harmony, tranquility. Hanukkah candles have a great purpose. Their purpose is to publicize the miracle, Persuma Nisa. So as great as it is, you're publicizing God's miracle. But peace is greater than God's miracle, publicity of God's miracle. And therefore, you use it for Shabbos candle. And Maimonides then concludes and continues and says, because shalom, peace, is the greatest thing in this world. It's the greatest thing in this world. And uh, God himself says, erase my name in order to preserve peace at home, in the home. Referring to the mitzvah of Sota in the, ta- in the Torah, in the book of uh, Bamidbar Nase in uh, Numbers, it talks about a mitzvah, it's an obscure mitzvah today, it's not really, doesn't exist in a technical sense. But it's a question of infidelity between husband and wife, and the wife is in question. So there's a whole process how you prove her innocence. And it includes, God says, to take his name, which you put on a piece of parchment like we do on say, on a mezuzah or on a Torah scroll or on a tefillin. But here you put a particular uh, text on a piece of parchment which has sanctity to it. Whenever God's name is written on a parchment, it has sanctity. That's why, you know, you see, for example, um, God forbid, if a Torah scroll falls down on the ground, it's considered to be a bad omen. And people fast. It's a whole thing. It's not a simple matter. Because it's a holy scroll. So here, God says... Take my name, put it on a piece of parchment, and erase it, because the process includes erasing it, putting it into the woman's mouth, etc. Just to be able to preserve peace between husband and wife, to prove that she's innocent and that her husband and her can continue living in, in harmony together. Now, there are many ways God could have proven um, that a woman is innocent. He doesn't have to use such extreme measures. But there's an intention here to show that religion should never be in the way of the harmony between two people. That's how powerful peace is. That's what Maimonides brings as, as, as a support to the idea why the power of Shabbos, that the shalom bias of peace at home, is greater than the miracle that the miracle of that God, a miracle, publicizing God's miracle. And then Maimonides concludes. Like the whole Torah was given only for no other reason than to bring peace into this world. Shenemer, like it says in the book of Proverbs, all its paths are, are just or are sweet or are pleasant. All its paths, are, all its roads, all its paths are pleasant. And all its, another word for paths, in other words, roads lead to peace. That's a verse. And that's how he concludes the laws of Hanukkah. You know, just to give you an example of it in, uh, in uh, halachic or in Jewish, Jewish tradition, you find a similar thing when Abraham was sitting at the mouth of his tent and he was healing from circumcising himself. He was a man of 99, 100 years old. So the Torah says that God came to see him the first time, to visit him. And we learn from that, we derive from that, that we visit the sick. Just as God visits the sick, we too do. God came to visit Abraham, who had circumcised himself at God's command. So in the heat of the summer, the heat of the, I'm sorry, the heat of the, of the, of the desert, God comes to visit him. And then it continues and says, and, he, and, and behold, Abraham lifted his eyes and he saw three strangers, three nomads walking in the desert toward him. He turned away from God and he ran and welcomed them into his tent and uh, fed them and so on. They ended up being angels, but he had no clue that they were that. He thought they were just plain Arabs. This is another, this is a Middle Eastern story, long before the Middle East of today. And we derive from this the mitzvah of greeting guests. So right there you have the visiting sick and greeting guests. But the Talmud says a very powerful statement. It says, Greeting guests is greater than greeting God. The Shekhinah. 
Kedelem Achnosis Pnei Hashchina. How do we know this? Because Abraham turned away from the Shekhinah, from God's presence, to greet the guests. So the obvious question is that we know it from Abraham, but how did he know it? Imagine, God comes, doesn't make appearances every day to the human race. He suddenly appears to Abraham, a pretty special guest. You wouldn't even do it to a normal human guest. Someone comes to see you in a hospital, God forbid, or you're healing, or just comes to visit you, and suddenly you see three people wandering is it respectful without asking permission to just turn away from, why, why is this uh, guest worse than, uh, better than the other three? Worse than the other three, rather. So where, how did Abraham have the chutzpah to just turn away from God's presenting himself, visiting him, and doesn't say anywhere that he asked permission or he, turned, or, he, or he granted permission, and he just spontaneously went and turned to the guests? The answer is, obviously, because Abraham was Abraham, so he knew he knew the spirit of the law, even though the law was derived from him, and that is that it wasn't turning away from God. He was turning away from his relationship with God to God's relationship with other people. Yes, for his own personal pleasure, it was great to see God and talk to God and have God visit him. But when he saw three people walking the, wandering the wilderness, in the desert, without food or drink, and not knowing maybe they're in danger, maybe they need drink, he realized that these are three creatures that God put on this earth. And by turning to them, he was not being disrespectful to God. He was actually greeting God in a deeper way. Which is like, for example, there's also a statement that when, of all people, Jesus himself was a student of uh, Hananiah ben Tradian, a great uh, Torah scholar. I'm sorry, Rishu ben Prachia. And it says that he came to see him before he decided to leave and start his own thing. And Rishu ben Prachia was in the middle of praying. And when his student, it was called Yeshua, or uh, however the Talmud puts it, came to see him, so he made it with his hand, you know, like as if he was sending him away. And Jesus misunderstood. He thought he was sending him away, so he, never, he left and never to return. So it says in law, in halacha, in the laws of studying, of teaching Torah, of teachers and students, do not be like Yeshua ben Prachia, that when your student comes to you, push him away. In other words, Stop your prayer and say hello to him. Greet him. Because don't give him the message that you're pushing him away. Because we see what happened there. Now Jesus had plenty of problems. It wasn't so simple. And yet, student, he was a student. So you learn from these major lessons that greeting God and serving God can be also has its traps. It can become selfish. It's you and God and no one else. Abraham taught the path like the Maimonides dictates, erase my name in order to preserve peace. What, how could God say that? Because you're not really erasing his name. You're erasing his, technically his name. But preserving peace is bringing God into the home. So it's not replacing a, uh, a, a, a God with something that is not godly. You're replacing God instead of just a God for you. It's a God for your family. Someone who uses religion and says to a spouse, look, I'm too religious to, to be friendly to you or to be too intimate with you or too religious to, uh, you know, to live in your home together because unless you change your ways, is that a person who's uh, serving God or serving themselves and using God as an excuse? Obviously, this has to be addressed case by case and not every situation is the same. But the concept is there. So the, so the Maimonides makes it clear the entire Torah was brought to bring peace into this world. So what does the word peace mean, shalom? Peace in Hebrew doesn't just mean peace. It's not just the absence of war. The word shalom in Hebrew also has meaning complete, wholesome. And it's not just the absence of war. It's not just the absence of discord. It's a state of its own. And to explain it, let me use it in Kabbalistic terminology. You're familiar with the spheres, the ten spheres, seven of which we count each of these 49 days between Passover and Shavuos. So seven weeks correspond to the seven emotional spheres. Seven emotional divine attributes which in turn evolve into our seven emotional faculties. Chesed is the first love. Gvura, discipline. Teferis is compassion. Then comes Netzach, Chayid, Yisrael, Malchus. Ambition, humility, bonding, and dignity. And the full spe the spectrum of human emotions are all these seven, times seven, turning into 49. So you have chesed of chesed, love within love, discipline within love, 
compassion within love, and so on. And each of the seven weeks, we go through all seven within the seven. So it's a very intense refinement process of character development, introspection, examination, and repair. Tikkun, improving each of these uh, components within ourselves. So Tiferes, which is the third week, where we are now, um, Tiferes, besides being, what I just said, compassion, empathy, also is shalom, is also peace. So you see from this, it's not just a dimension that's absence of something else. Well, how is it peace? Because true peace is not the same as everybody being one, oneness. Unity, in Jewish thought, unity, echad, we say Hashem echad, and peace is harmony within diversity. If everybody on this earth became a clone of each other, and there's only one clone, that's not, that's not called shalom. That's called annihilation of everybody's individuality, and you have only one person that prevails. It's like the, the joke that says that, um, you know, uh, we'll be at peace with each other as long as you agree with everything I say. So, shalom, to put it in the context, let's say, of how the days of the week work, so you have the six days of creation and then Shabbat, that's also seven. Sunday is chesed, love, Monday is gvura, the separation, discipline, the third day, vegetation, is, is, is harmony, then comes the fourth day, the luminaries is uh, netzach, well, Thursday is hoid, Friday is bonding, sisod, and Shabbat is malchut, the king, the queen. So the third day, what do we see in the, to in the Bible? Look in the Bible. It says each day God said he created something each day. The first day, light. The second day, separated the heavens and the higher and the lower waters. And the third day, he created vegetation. So each day it says, Vayar Lekim, he saw what he created. Vayar Lekim, Kitoiv, that is good. He said that what he created was good. On Monday, you don't find God said that it was good. But on Tuesday, you find that God said, He said twice that it's good. So the commentaries explain. A brilliant explanation in the Medrash that because the second day, even though it was a creation of God, but it was the creation of diversity, of separation. Day one, we say, We don't call it Yom Echad. In the context, in the sequence of numbers, Rishon, Shein, Ishlishi. All the other days are Shani Shlisi, two, second, third, fourth. The first one is called day one, not the first day. Because that day oneness prevailed, it was only one entity. It was God and light. Light is reflection of its source. It's all oneness. But day two, God said, I will separate the higher from the lower. Because the purpose of creation is not that there be only oneness, that there be diversity. He created diversity. Now diversity is beautiful. But diversity has the potential also for what we call divisiveness. When there's only one, day one, there can be no divisiveness. There can be no separation because there are, there are no two entities. Day two is the creation of separation. Machlekes, the potential for discord and war was created. Therefore, God says, does not say the word good because it was not revealed good yet. But day three comes and says, day three, like the machriya b'neihem, the verse says, there's two contradictory verses and then you bring a third verse that reconciles between the two. In this case, like a mediator. Two people have an opi different opinions. And you have a third force, voice, that reconciles between these two. That's shalom. And then we have to double good. The good for day two and the good for day three. So you see that the diversity of day two has been redeemed. It's not turned into war. It's turned into a beauty. And Teferis is also beauty. When you look at beauty, what, a thing that's beautiful never is one-dimensional. Any beautiful piece of art, beautiful piece of music, in many, many dimensions, many, many parts and pieces. In art, many different hues and shadows and colors and elements. In music, musical notes. You can have one beautiful musical note. It's not beautiful. It can be pleasant. But after a while, it'll drone and drone on and on. It'll, be, it'll become noise. The beauty is that there are many different musical notes and they're combined in the right order, creating harmony within diversity. That's beauty. Say a beautiful face. Till this day, we don't really know what that means. Some faces are just beautiful. Is it the symmetry? But it's definitely not one feature. A face is a complex entity with many, many features. There's a certain symmetry, a certain coordination, 
certain, they, some scientists define certain space between the eyes, the brow, etc., etc. It's beautiful. There's certain classical beautiful futures. Then, of course, there's beauty in the eyes of the beholder. But also, beauty is ultimately a, for, a, a contradiction, a paradox. It is the symmetry of many different parts working together. And we all know how it feels. You know when you, let's say, build something, or you put together components, not just necessarily physical, writing something, putting a lot of different things, or organizing your, your kitchen, or organizing your office. There's something about taking many different things and putting them all in the right place that you can access them quickly, creates a certain harmony and a certain deep satisfaction. Even young children give them objects of different shapes and colors. And then when they fit them in, and it all comes together, there's a certain gravitation toward this type of harmony. But the paradox is that the same diversity could also lead to tremendous disharmony and tremendous discord and war and destruction. So the secret is how do you find that balance, that shalom thing? Now this is, as I said, the purpose of the entire Torah. That's why you'll find this theme everywhere. From how the beginning of creation, day one, day two, day three. Like why do we have to know what happened every one of those days? It happened once and that was it. But not only do we know it, we say it every day, we say a song for each day, and we remember each day has its personality. Because it's not just about a one-time thing God had to put into place that the structure of time is seven days, six days plus Shabbos. It's because in our own lives, we also have diversity. We have the seven emotions. And God created a multi-dimensional, multi-faceted universe that has basically almost infinite differences. No two people think alike. Ain't they saying Shabbos? No two people's faces are alike. Even twins, even identical twins are not exactly alike. So there are no two things like why they're not alike physically, because they're not alike spiritually. Because God wouldn't have, need to cre put two of the same things on this earth. What's the point? In other words, two things have two different purposes. Therefore, they also have two different bodies and two different looks and feel and so on. So each of us has a verse to contribute, has a musical note to play, or more than one, that only you can play. And only when the human race, the six billion of us and counting, play it all, each in our place, will you, do you create real harmony. And, and this is what God wants, and that's why he created the universe. So then tell me, how is religious terrorism born? And again, you can dismiss it and say these are violent people who would have been criminals and murderers. And they just happen to choose religion, and that's where they, their outlet is. I beg to differ, I don't believe that's at all the case. Yes, there may be some people with violent tendencies that happen to become terrorists. But in the case of terrorism, as we know, it's the other way around. It's religious passions that turn into terror, not the other way. And you can see it again and again. You see the pr profiles of the people. You see what kind of people. You see how they are in their own homes and so on. What happens is that when you're dealing with God, things can get out of control. Okay? What that means, the passions of faith can become so um, untamed that you, you justify in your own mind, this is what God wants. And you forget the basic law that Abraham taught, that you turn away from God to greet people. You erase God's name to uh, save uh, a marriage and build home, peace at home. This, for some reason, was forgotten, first by the Christians, the early generations when they launched crusades, and now by the Muslims. And even among the Jews, I will say, that we also have to face these challenges. So it's a, it's a universal challenge. They have a classic story. I've shared it with, I think, but it's on a smaller scale, just to show you how important this message is. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai, a man that we, in a few weeks we will celebrate his great day, called the Day of His Joy, which is actually the day of his yard site, when he's soul elevated. In Israel, hundreds of thousands of people make a pilgrimage to Miron, northern Israel, <clears throat> to honor him. And all over the world there's customs, people, bonfires, parades, parties, picnics, children. It's a big day. Not everyone really understands what's the power of this day because it's somewhat of a mystical and mysterious day. But it's, it goes down traditions, Farim, Ashkenazim, Chassidim, Rab Shimon Bayechai, the day of Rab Shimon Bayechai. There's many stories told about him. Here's one in the Talmud. He lived in the time of the Romans, right after the destruction of the temple. And the Romans were out to get him, as they were many of the great leaders and sages. So there was a decree to kill him. He went into hiding. He hid for 12 years in a cave. 
with his son, Rabbi Lazar. And the Talmud tells the whole story is miracle, miracles, how he ate a certain miracle. A tree grew near there, a carob tree and a brook of water, a spring of water. And they were studying. They were so immersed for 12 years. And these were not just Talmudic sages, great mystics. That they became so refined, so sublime, that when they came out of the cave, it says, wherever Rav Shimon by Yechai, after the Romans, the news came that the Romans, the decree passed or the king died, whatever. So Rav Shimon by Yechai, first time came back to civilization. What do you think happened? Here's a man, for 12 years, without stop, without, was immersed in the deeper secrets of mysticism, of spirituality, serving God. That's all he did. He had no other option. So when he encountered civilization again, it says whatever he looked at began to burn. Because his high level of spirituality was so intense that he could not tolerate the pettiness and the small-mindedness, and the parochialness of daily activities of people. It saw it as like how people could be so superficial and shallow. So everything began to burn, whether it's physically burning or spiritually burning. But the bottom line is, his great energy was intolerant and was not allowing anything to exist. So God says to him, this is Rav Shem Bayechai, you're not ready to come out. Go back for one more year, 13th year, Bar Mitzvah year. <coughs> and you need another level of maturity. And this time, when you come out, wherever you go, and this is what actually happened, you will not only not burn it, you'll repair it. That whatever Rashbi saw, Rashim Bayechai saw, he repaired. He saw a problem, he went to fix it. So you would think, where, what level was a greater level? The 12th year seems greater than the 13th. The 13th seems like he uh, mellowed out or something, you know, and became more tolerant. Whereas in the 12th year, his passion was so intense, the fire was so intense, everything burnt. No, obviously that's not accurate. The 13th year was far greater. Because it's not that he lost his spiritual connection over the 12 years. He went a step further. He had it, but he also learned what's called restraint. He learned the power of silence. He learned the power that you have to learn to spoon feed people. You have to learn to nurture. You can't just destroy everything in your path, even if it's actually superficial and shallow and even criminal. Abraham prayed for infidels. Infidels. Sodom and Gomorrah were as infidel as it gets. And it's interesting, because I'm reading some of the Arabic literature, literature from uh, Kitab. Sayyid Kitab was one of the great teachers of bin Laden. Plus another one, his name was uh, Azam. They quote, they quote, they keep calling the West Saddam, which is a biblical statement. And I always wonder, why don't they read the second half of the story, that, Jake, that Abraham's prayed for them. Instead, they're blowing up the World Trade Center. So even if you're, even if you're totally correct that the whole Western world, everybody, which isn't correct, but that's for argument's sake, everybody is criminal. Everybody is a sinner. Including men, women, children, newborns, and so on. Even there, Abraham prayed. So, I don't, so how, where, how does that happen? What happens is that when the passions start being awakened, it gets out of control. The fires start burning, and you get blinded. You get blinded not by secularism. You get blinded by your version of God. And that is very, very difficult to fight. Especially if you grew up, let's say, in a billionaire's home. And you saw the indulgences and corruption going on in Saudi Arabia. So what's your comparison? What do you prefer? That's not what God wants. So you go to the other extreme. It's natural tendency. Rajbi only needed a year. The Muslim world may need more than a year. I mentioned the Christian world only as a precedent in history because what happened at the end was with the birth of the United States of America, which is a country founded by Christians. With, uh, with uh, the late democracy as it began to flourish and freedom, what happened was that the principles of Christianity remained intact. But that radical side that you have to kill others in order for you to be right, that you have to silence others. In the United States, you have very clearly the beginning of the Declaration of Independence, that by virtue of the Creator, all of us are created equal. And by that virtue, we have inalienable rights, the rights of freedom of religion, of speech, of press, of expression. 
And that means, yes, that a person can choose a different religion than you, can choose no religion. That's all guaranteed. So it means even if you adamantly disagree with that person, that person has the dignity and the sanctity to make choices, even if you don't agree with those choices. And I think, why did no one think of this concept before 1776? I mean, isn't it so, isn't it so simple? Millions, billions of people. You have people like great thinkers, Aristotle, Plato, Socrates in the Greek world. You had thinkers in the East, all over. How come no one ever came up with this concept? It took so many years to figure that out. Because when, the, when, when you first you begin with a pagan life, then you discover God, it becomes out of control. It take, takes time to mature. It needs maturity. And don't underestimate the powers when someone gets inspired. When you get inspired and it touches you deeply, it's precisely because it touched you so deeply. That's why it becomes dangerous. Because you become blinded. As the Kutzke Rebbe says in the Mishnah in Pirkei Avot, that we also study now, Every argument that is the name of God will, will, uh, will never end. So the literal meaning in the Mishnah is that it's a positive thing. So we'll go on and on because it's not like the battle between Korach who uh, mutineered against Moses. That ends ultimately because he was in the wrong. But when two people like Shammai and Hillel, two great scholars, state an opinion, since they both have legitimacy and, credit, and, and they both have a point to make, that type of argument is a healthy argument. That's the literal meaning of it. Like I said, diversity. It's good to be diversity. That's how we create, we find deeper concepts. When two people argue a con idea pleasantly, and they, each one brings their strengths, you come away with a much stronger uh, conclusion because you've stretched the idea, you've allowed it to be challenged, etc. But the Kutzke Rebbe, in his sharp way, says another interpretation, that when you're fighting and everyone says it's the name of God, this war will never end. Because everyone thinks they're right. Because they're fighting now for God. It's not about me. I know in counseling people, you know how often I've had to deal with the situation two people come to me. Each one says... I would have uh, long ago compromised, but God can't compromise. And when I ask him who, who appointed you as God's uh, advocate, and then, of course, you hear the other person says exactly the same thing. He says, I would have long ago compromised. It's God that doesn't want this. How do you answer that? And they're convinced of that. And what they want from me is to take one side. Each one wants that person. They don't want to hear a third opinion. You know, the third opinion is, you're both right. And the same God also says he wants you both to compromise. That's the way you say it. You know, because they're convinced. I mean, to convince somebody that they're not representative of God is not so easy once they've self-appointed themselves. And uh, so it's easier to just say, listen, I also have a connection with God. And he told me um, last night that uh, you both have to compromise. That's worked, by the way. Not always, but it has worked. You know, I'm, I also invoke the name of God. So sometimes that's what you need to do. Um, anyway, to go back to, to the discussion here, so before the Bin Laden episode this past Sunday, which by the way was the humility that's necessary within discipline, which really means that when you're disciplining and talking to someone in the name of religion and faith, you need a lot of humility and make sure your discipline does not go out of control. It's interesting that's the day. Um, so I had a different theme to discuss this evening. But then that news broke, I thought it should all be connected. And this is connected. So the title of the class initially was When Number Two is Greater Than Number One, The Power of the Second Month. So here's uh, the connection, here's the thought. Um, I, if any of you read the email, there's an interesting case study with Avis and Hertz rental cars. Um, Hertz is number one rental company in the world, Avis is number two for a long time. Um, so there's a classic uh, case study that they study in advertising school, and that is that Avis, of course, developed its tagline, we try harder, which suggests that, you know, that, hey, because we're number two, we're always trying harder, which has a, you know, creates loyalty for those that are looking for someone that tries harder. You know, the underdog, let's put it that way. Um, so, but then, of course, the board uh, at Avis decided, one second, why do we have to be... Uh, resign ourselves to remain number two, let's invest and figure out a way to become number one. Okay. Well, they did, and they invested a lot of money, and they lost a lot of money, and they ended up becoming number three, and the statistics showed they were sliding even further down. 
It wasn't just because Hertz was already number one, it was because people saw Avis as that, and that became their image. It's not so easy to tamper with your own image, even if you don't like to be called number two. So they went back and embraced the number two niche, and that was that. And they do try harder, hopefully. Today we have other alternatives to both of them, so that's another story. Um, but I was thinking about it because, as I mentioned before in the numbers game, one, two, and three, so number one I said was unity, number two is diversity, and number three is shalom, peace. The first three days of the week, Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday are like that. The double good is only on Tuesday. Number one, as powerful as it is, does not have double good. So light and God, divine unity of day one did not have the double good that can only come from beauty that comes harmony within diversity. And the same is true on the month level. What is in, in, the, in the Bible, in the Torah, the months are not called by names, they're called by numbers. The names, the Talmud says, Shema, Sha'olo, Imam, Babavel, Babavel, the names that we give to the Hebrew months, like Tishrei, Cheshvan, Kislev, Teve, Shvat, Odin, Nisan, and so on, Ir, are names that, that the Jews um, gave these months when they were in Babylon. There are a few references to some of these names in Tanakh, but primarily, especially in Chumash, in the first five books, the, num the months are called by, by, by number. God says, This month, he tells Moses in Egypt, look up, this month, the new moon of this month is, will be the first of your months. You start counting the months. The Jewish calendar is lunar. Month, and, and from there on, we start counting. Nisan is month one. Ir is Chedesh HaSheni. You'll find places like, uh, like next month, we'll soon have Pesach Sheni. So it says, Chedesh HaSheni, in the second month, on the 15th day of Nisan, a month after they left Passover, an episode took place. Third month, when you say the Jews came to Sinai, Bechidish Hashlishi, Beyem Hazet. Then the third month, on this day, which is Rosh Chodesh, they arrived at Sinai. Then Tammuz is month, fourth month, Tishrei, where we celebrate holidays like Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, is Chedesh Hashvi, is the seventh month. In the lunar cycle, Rosh Hashanah is the first and annual solar cycle. So, the significance, therefore, of these months is also associates with these one, two, and three. So what's the difference between Nisan, Ir, and Sivan? We're now in the second month, meaning the month that follows Nisan, the first month. So Nisan, as we all know, is the celebration of Passover. It's a month of miracles, a month of revelation. Revelation from above. It says that God revealed himself and led the Jews through Moses out of Egypt. It all happened from above. As a matter of fact, in some places it says the Jews were not, were at the edge of being totally lost. Had they stayed another day in Egypt, they would never be able to leave, spiritually and physically. So it was a day, is a time where God, as it says, lifted them, al and Sharim, on the wings of eagles. And they say, an eagle carries its children above, on top of its wings. Other birds carry their children under their legs. Now, you see different birds. The reason is because eagles are the f highest flying birds. So predators can't get the children because they're above the wings. If an eagle carried the birds, its children by its legs, a predator could potentially attack. Other birds carry them below because the eagle shouldn't be able to get them. The eagle is high, flies higher than they. Anyway, the point is that it was a revelation from above. Then comes the second month of Ir. And here, what do we have? We have the countdown, the 49 days. We're counting from Passover to Shavuos. It was a time of serious, as I mentioned, introspection. The Jews began to prepare themselves to Mount Sinai. There was no revelation. I mean, there were revelations, but primarily it was about their work. And when they would finish 49 days, would come the 50th day in the third month, Matan Torah, Tiferes Su Matan Torah, the Talmud says, that the giving of the Torah at Sinai was Tiferes, was Shalom. It brought peace between heaven and earth. It bridged spirit and matter, the body and the soul. So in the deeper context, what it means is the following. In the order, in the usual order of things, the early stages of our lives, someone provides for us. Healthy parents, hopefully, support us. A child is born, it's nurtured, protected, fed. 
by its parents. Very much chesed nerayach, when the Jews left Egypt, they were considered like children, and God protected them. But then the, the maturity process begins. You begin to grow. And now a child has to learn to walk on his own feet, or her own feet. And this intentionally has to be without a divine intervention. If your parents continue to hold you and continue to protect you as you are a newborn, you'll never learn to stand on your own. So this comes, the second step is from the bottom up. You start working on yourself and you grow. And there, then comes stage three, month three, where there's a fusion between the two. Where you have both heaven, the strengths from heaven, and your work from below that become one. And that's when you have total harmony. So the Kabbalists talk about this in the context of, um, of uh, divine unity. One of the biggest challenges, mystical challenges, is that God is omnipresent everywhere and is the energizing force behind everything that we see. Every fiber of existence is pulsating with divine energy. The question is then, do we really exist or don't we? Maybe it's an illusion. And the Kabbalists discuss this issue at length. Because on one hand, you cannot say God created an illusion. Created this, we created this universe for a purpose. And the Bible itself says God created heaven and earth. That means it's real. On the other hand, how could the reality of a blind universe or a gnostic universe coexist with an omnipresent God? And this is not easily addressed and easily uh, dealt with. Different Kabbalists, different mystics came up with different answers. And as a matter of fact, the Torah itself compels us to seek. Because God says, don't just believe in me, know me. Know my ways. I want you to understand my, my approach. So God, in other words, created and embedded in the universe clues that will answer this, this the biggest dilemma. The greatest prayer in Jewish liturgy is Shema. We say here, O Israel, that God is one. Hashem Echad. With emphasis on the Echad. What is Echad? Oneness, unity. Not just that God is one, but that there's one reality. That's why the Talmud says that Echad is an acronym for three, is, a, uh, is, a, is an acronym for three letters. Echad, Aleph, is oneness. Ches is the seven heavens and the earth. And Dalad are the Dalad Ruch Yisraelam are the four directions, north, south, east, west. That the oneness of the divine has to permeate and saturate all of existence. So it would be easy on one hand to just argue, you know what, the divine light, the divine dominates, and let the world be annihilated in an apocalypse, and it will be swallowed up and burned up by the divine unity. That would not be unity. On the other hand, if the universe continues functioning on its own, on its own terms, it's very easy to deny God's presence. How do you create a fusion of these two, the, the harmony of the two opposites? When I said before that, God says shalom bayis is more important than anything. This is also shalom bayis. Peace between God and his creatures, which are sometimes compared to a husband and wife, the spouse. Matan Torah, chasanase, yem chasanase, is that matan Torah? Sinai is considered a marriage. How do you marry the two without one being compromised? So here's not the place to go into the elaborate Kabbalistic and Hasidic explanations. I'll just briefly say the following. And if you want to read more, I would suggest... Um, in my book, Toward a Meaningful Life, I have a chapter called Unity. And also God. Those two chapters discuss it at length. But briefly, I mean in simple, palatable English. And there are other places, obviously, that discuss this. It's really the essence of all of Kabbalah that comes to answer this question. How can we coexist with a higher reality and remain intact, remain ourselves? You know? So the ultimate answer is based on the teachings of the Arizal who revealed the concept of the tzimtzum. That God in his infinite and mysterious way say that tzimtzum, it's a secret, it's a mystery, has the power to conceal his presence from us. That means he's still here, but on our level, on our conscious level, unconsciously he's here, but consciously we cannot see him. We cannot perceive him with our five senses. And it takes hard work, well it takes work to discover that, 
discover God, and more on harder work, not just to discover that there's a God and sense there's a higher reality, but to live your way, your life aligned with that. That's the challenge. Many people believe in God, and many of them believe even authentically, but they don't necessarily live by that. Because every day to feel 24-7 that God is with you all the time would basically mean you would never be able to sin. Because you would not be able to wander away from your own life's purpose and calling. So God intentionally created this concealment created this concealment, and the mission is for us to pierce this, this, the veil and reveal the divine. And this is an elaborate process of how we do that through many different mitzvahs, through study, through prayer, through acts of kindness. Every time we defy the selfishness and narcissism and greed of this material universe, we are piercing its veil. We're piercing its armor and allowing in a little divine power. When we six billion people will do it properly, that's obviously totally messianic. We're told you don't need all six billion to do it, you need a tipping point. You need, so, you need the, the accumulative effort of many, many over the centuries and millennia to finally erupt and then the world will be transformed. So in the context then for in our own process, there are times that you'll be inspired. You'll have an inspiration. You may not even be ready for it. Spontaneous. You're sitting in a class, you go to a synagogue on Yom Kippur, you're sitting at a Seder, maybe you're just watching nature, maybe you're, just, maybe you're riding in a cab and you just have an epiphany. It's a moment of grace from above. That's like Nissen. Something from above sends you a gift. It's very powerful. But the downside is it's not yours. You don't own it because you didn't create it. You didn't generate it. So it says, Adam reitzim bekav shaleh yeshem metisha kav mshal A person has more pleasure from one dollar that you earn on your own than nine dollars that someone gives you as a gift. Now you know that non, one dollar cannot buy as much as nine, but it's yours. Nine dollars that someone gives you as a gift, you'll blow far easier. Because you earn it. You don't have the same um, care. It's not your own. There's something about self-generated effort that has value, even though maybe less achievement purely in the sheer firepower quantity, but qualitatively, qualitatively, it's much more valuable. And you won't lose it so quickly, because it's yours, you worked hard at it. You know, King Solomon, that famous Solomonic wisdom, when the two mothers all both argued that the child is theirs, so what does King Solomon say? Okay, you know what, we'll cut the child in half. And then you both have half of the child. And of course, one woman said, no problem, you should get half, it's better than nothing I get. And the other one said, no, nope, I'd rather that the other woman take it. So he re 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 immediately knew who's, who owns this child, who's mother. So there's the thing of kav shaloi, aveda b'kayach atzmei, we call it, self-generated effort. So nissen, inspiration, is very good to ignite things. But ear, the second month, is the key month when things are sustained and maintained, because then it becomes yours. So we do it through counting the omer, that's yours, work painstaking, slowly. It will not have the revelation of, of Nissan. The miracles that happen in that first month do not happen in the second month. But what happens in the second month, it becomes yours. Now it's part of who you are. And as you integrate it, you become, your containers expand, and you become more conducive, more, um, more able to assimilate more divine power. So then comes the month three, when the power of Nissan is joined with you, and, you, and your personality. And you have something that's greater than even than Nissan. Because in Nissan, the inspiration was an inspiration. On the level of the inspiration, it's great, but it's not necessarily yours yet. Now you can own it. And you can own something that was beyond you at some point. The classic example given of is a teacher and students. So think of a beginner student who's just beginning to learn ABC, Olive Bays. So we, we both, we all know here that ABC is necessary for everything later to know how to read, to know how to write ideas, even the most abstract ideas. They all begin by some type of words, some type of concepts. And from there, you learn to transcend words. But when a little child is starting to learn in kindergarten, ABC or Olive Bays, they have no clue what they're learning. They're just accepting, absorbing whatever is taught. And it's blind. It's, 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 there's no rationale to it. Try teaching ABC to a 30-year-old, to a 20-year-old. A 15-year-old. It's extremely difficult because their mind is working already. ABC makes no sense. 
But within the ABC, the teacher's teaching is teaching all the wisdom is in this alphabet. So a great teacher with great mind has to condense, has to conceal the symptom, all the light, and just give forth, as the Kabbalists say, as the Arizal says, a kavachut, a transmission, a very narrow thread of light. This is a transmission of ideas that are spoon-fed and catered and customized to a child. Then, as the child grows, the letters become words, and the words become sentences, and the sentences become paragraphs, and paragraphs become chapters, and chapters become books, and books become volumes, and series, and so on. I mean, just metaphorically speaking. The wisdom of the child begins to grow, the mind begins to grow. As the child's containers expand, more light from the teacher can enter, so the transmission grows. At some point, the student can become as powerful, if not more, than the teacher. We see this many times. You see students who, who surpass their teachers because they have developed and now can contain all that light and go farther. This is the example. If God's light was completely revealed, it would be like a child suddenly trying to have, being forced to listen to some type of brilliant ideas. Not only would it, make, would it not, impact, not be absorbed by the child, the child could be even damaged because it would be overwhelming. It would like, you know, completely uh, uh, be demoralizing. So God conceals his light like the teacher conceals, but then transmits very slowly, step by step by step. And as the transmission, as the, as the containers, as we do our work in the second month of expanding our containers, the light can manifest. And then we're ready for Mount Torah. Interestingly, the 50th day is not counted. We count the 49 days. That's our work. The 50th day emerges. It emerges from a place that you can't directly reach, but you could never reach it if you didn't have 49. This is true in any type of uh, work that we do. You know, as I mentioned, there's an epiphany and a revelation that comes before the work, the inspiration. But then there's an epiphany that comes at the end of the work. If you ever really research something and work very hard, there's something, you come to a point of a breakthrough where something new emerges. And you know it's not just direct result of your, it's, it's, that it's a direct result of your efforts, but it's not directly part of one effort. It's the accumulation of all your efforts have created a container to allow something greater to emerge. This is what happens when people train for a long time, practice, whether it's in sports, in music, in art, in writing, everything. You train not long enough, you do your work, you, do, you pay your dues, then things start emerging. And that's when miracles, real miracles happen. Because the first miracles are ignite the process, but they're not yet yours. The second stage is containing it making it yours. And then you're ready to achieve something that is even beyond the divine revelations of Nisan, Mount Sinai. Sinai, it says, that which was above came below, and the below went above a fusion of heaven and earth. So what is it in context of, well, the Ava story in the sense is like you try harder when you're number two. You see, number one is a great revelation, but there's not a lot of work on our end. Work comes when you don't have revelation. That's uh, the connection, just to, to complete the circle. Um, I don't think Avis thought it through on that level that they compare themselves to the month of Ir and Sri Omer and personal refinement. But uh, it's, it's, it's an example I'm using that in marketing and business that applies. And the question, of course, is who's number three in the, the, in the rental business? That's another discussion. Um, I don't know if there is one per se in this context. So there's the element of that trying harder. The work that comes, you try harder when it's on your, it's with, through your efforts. But the connection to the whole Bin Laden discussion I had earlier, religion and faith and so on, is as follows. It's the same thing. You see, God could have also burned up this universe very easily. As a matter of fact, he says in Shai Yuchud Vamunu, it's the second section in Tanya, if you want to look it up. Very powerful words. He said, the divine energy vivifies and sustains everything in existence. And Ilunitna, he says, should we have been given permission, for, even for one second, to see that divine energy, everything would cease to be. Because the divine energy would simply subsume and completely submerge everything in existence. And all you'd see is energy. There'd be no room for us to be. We could not sense ourselves as an independent reality in face of the divine power. So there has to be a concealment. But the fascinating thing is that once we begin to, to work on it, we one day can see that type of power because we have then the containers to do so. 
So this is what Rashbi learned, and this is what I was discussing earlier, that, that divine light is very powerful. And when you're really connected, you become very intolerant of anyone that is superficial, petty, selfish, and so on. And the more religious you are, as a matter of fact, the more connected to God, the more intolerant one should be, because you, the argument goes, if you're, if you're complacent, and if you don't really care, that means that you're not really connected. But the key beauty here is that it doesn't stop there. That's fine in early stages. The second stage you need to learn is that you cannot act on your intolerance. You need to learn a maturity that God created a universe because if you think you're very religious and you think you're very passionate, just imagine if God revealed all his light, you and no one would exist. Even the fanatics in this world wouldn't exist. And I'm saying this even if, this person, even if the person is a truly God-fearing person and is not just hiding behind fanaticism like they call religious addiction as just another uh, way of fulfilling your own uh, personal indulgences. You know, there are people like that too. Hasidic thought talks about people. Whenever, there is, whenever it comes to punish somebody, because if it's sin, they're always first online. And you think that they're first online because they're the most, the most devout. No. They're first online because they're the most wicked. But they know that they're dressed up in religious garb. So they, they, use their wicked, they use religion to justify their wickedness. Their cruelty. And that's a very dangerous thing. Because if it's not dressed up in garments of piety, you know, it's one thing. But to use piety, and as, as opposed to what Abraham did, and opposed to what, um, what uh, Rashbi did and so on, that's very dangerous. So the first thing we need to know is nobody on this earth can tolerate the divine light completely emerging. Because then all of us, it wouldn't just be the World Trade Center, it would be the whole world would disappear. So God made it very clear that's not the way it goes. God himself concealed his presence. And then he said, I will give you a path of life, a path of virtue. It's a very powerful path. And when you start embracing it, don't think about yourself. You need to be humble. Because if you do, you're going to start using me to destroy the world around you. And, I'm, and I tell you, erase my name in order to preserve peace. Not because God is saying compromise your values. Because you're misusing them, you're abusing them, you're misunderstanding the reason that you have piety and, and devotion. It's not about you, and it's not about you standing in judgment of others. It's not about your religion being superior to anyone else. If you're truly God-fearing, as it says, those that love God love also what God loves. And God loves his children. That means all people in this universe. As soon as you divorce the two and say, I love God, but I don't love his children, then you cease loving God. And it's a God on your terms. And a God in your terms is called idolatry. So fascinatingly, the most pious person who hurts someone else in the name of his piety is the greatest idol worshiper. He's worshiping himself. And not only that, he's using God to justify it. So we have in the Bible, it says, God created the human being in the divine image. Not the other way around. A person that decides, I don't think you're religious enough and therefore I can hurt you. Or I don't think that you are entitled to uh, state your opinion, you're entitled to present yourself, you're basically saying, I'm creating a God in my own image. This is what I decided. And God has to follow along. It's lacking that type of humility. Now, the, the, the thing where it gets thorny, well, I should just conclude the point. So the key is that 13th year. You need to know restra exercise restraint, symptoms. Just like God creates symptoms, you also need symptoms. You have great light, great. Don't let it burn anybody. Don't let it hurt anyone. Learn to harness it, to channel it, to illuminate people. Fire is very powerful, but fire needs to be harnessed. And then you come to a point where you help people grow on their terms, not overwhelming them with the revelation from above, month one, but you help them work on their terms, expand their horizons their containers, then they will be ready one day to join you and fuse heaven and earth through love. There was a chassid, his name was Rabbi Shalom Bar Gordon, and he once asked the previous Chabad Rabbi, he asked him, so how is one supposed to deal with in America secular Jews or secular people? You know, do you, do you give them, do you rebuke them when you see them doing something wrong? Do you just tolerate it and say nothing? Which one is it? Like I said, which, what's the approach? Do you rebuke and, and, and break them? Fight with them? Or do you just tolerate it all and allow anything? 
So the Rebbe answered, he said to him, you know, you travel through Turkey. And in Turkey there's a thing called the Turkish bath. And everything has to have a lesson to us in life. You go into a Turkish bath, what, what's, the, what's the custom? First you go into the Schwitz, right? And uh, you go in, it's hot. Starts opening up your pores, cleansing, etc. And you start feeling better. And then, uh, of course, you go climb up a little higher. It's not a second level to because uh, heat rises. So the, the heat is higher and therefore can open up even more pores. You know, obviously there are many levels. You can go as high as you want. And then you come out, the way it is done in Turkish baths, you ask the attendant to slap you with these uh, eucalyptus uh, uh, leaves. They have these leaves that are bound like in, like in a broom. They slap you. It has some type. I never did it. But I knew, and I've heard from people, it's very exhilarating. You know, it's like, it's get the blood rushing after the schwitz and so on. So he says, so that's the way you do, that's the way you deal with people. The first thing is you warm them up. The second thing is you elevate them. You know, show them how much they can reach. Let them climb. Let them succeed. Let them grow. And then you won't need to do anything. They'll ask you to slap them. You know? <laughs> that's what he said. Right. So, in other words, when, you, when someone loves you, and you show that, and when you love someone, and, or the other way, you feel that someone loves you, and really cares about you, and it's not someone who's just trying to be judgmental, put you down because they feel better about themselves when you're less, you know, people who think that when you're wrong, then I must be right. You know, the more, more wrong you are, the more right I am. The more you fail, the more success I'll be, or at least we'll all be failures, and we're all in the same boat. It's called, uh, in, G- in German, they call it schadenfreude. In Yiddish, there's a thing called nishvaginen. You know, you know, fagin, not that you gain anything. It's just that if everyone else is, is failing, then you don't look so bad. Some type of like uh, pleasure we have from others not succeeding, even though we gain nothing from it. But whatever, people's uh, the, the, the different uh, quirks of our nature, human nature. But when you feel someone loves you, and they care about you, and they've demonstrated it, and uh, yes, if you're a healthy person, you'll want them to... Uh, tell you sometimes bluntly what they think. And if you're unable to do that, that's not such a good sign. Maybe you don't have someone that you really feel loves you. Because that's how we, we grow. And you'll be able to hear it from a person that cares about you. Because it didn't begin with rebuke and end with rebuke. It's not about someone's personal vendetta or agenda. It comes from love. This is a lesson for parents to children. It's a lesson from teachers to students. a lesson from friends. a lesson for spouses. No one, everyone can learn from this. So this is subtle form in microcosm is really what's going on in macrocosm. So if we just had two people on this earth, let's say Mr. Bin Laden and Abraham, that would be interesting, you know, (laughs) what would happen. But one thing is for sure that it would be, since it's isolated to two people, it's a lot easier to deal with. The problem is when it becomes multiplied and then you have weapons and then again, I'm not in any way trying to vindicate or, or justify, condone anything that you know, killing is killing, murder is murder, a person does deserve justice, and so on. Especially when you see the glee and the jubilation on the face of Bin Laden when he, when he heard how people were blown to pieces after a suicide bomb. You know, the glee, the happiness. Since when does someone celebrate death? You know? Um, so in that, in that context, in that context, this idea of understanding how the divine is reconciled with the universe is the key message. And it has direct lessons to us. That's the interesting thing. So, again, I qualify. I'm not comparing the two. But that we have similarities? Absolutely. Do you think if we in our own world, in our communities, our homes and families, and individually would learn to not just tolerate. I don't like the word tolerance. Tolerance suggests almost patronizing, you know, like I tolerate you. I'm not talking about tolerance talking about loving someone and knowing that maybe this is not the moment to create a confrontation. It has to be done with love. It has to be done with ultimately helping each other heal and repair. Not about one person, I am better than thou, holier than thou, condescension and all that. That if every person did that on a microcosmic level, you don't think it would have an impact on the larger world? Of course it would. Because here's where it gets thorny, as I said. You know, reading some of Bin Laden's statements, and I'm just refreshing myself now. I did it 10 years ago, and now I'm reading them again. And some others. And again, I don't want it to sound like any type of uh, trying to uh, intellectualize this. But it's interesting. A lot of it is based on that the Americans are arrogant. And what are they doing in Saudi Arabia? 
And the big spark that changed Bin Laden into a real radical, they all unequivocally say, was when the attack on Kuwait from, by, uh, by uh, Saddam Hussein and America coming in into Saudi Arabia to fight the war. This, they say, was a tipping point. The thing that pushed him over because he felt Saudi Arabia should be sort of as an insult. And I guess it confirmed all his religious things that the West, our infidels, are trying to you know, take, take, take control of our country, of our oil, and so on. The, the interesting thing is that when you're separated from the death, which, of course, as I said, is absolutely unacceptable, there's some truths in these ideas about Western, the Western world. And there's some truths about the, uh, America's deals with Saudi Arabia and oil and stuff like that. This isn't just purely driven by uh, some type of altruism. There's money, there's greed, there's corruption. Who knows what's there? That's where it gets complicated. So there's no question that there's no justification for killing any innocent person, even a, who, no, any, anyone. You know, Saudi Arabia is a sovereign state, a sovereign state that invited the United States in for good or for bad. You want to fight, to figure out, have a new election in Saudi Arabia. But to say that the Western world is perfect and that we have it all figured out, and we do have a fusion of the divine and this world, is also not correct. So I speak now as a Jew, I say, there are lessons you learn from this. You know, when you see a passionate person, as misplaced as it is, as obscene, and he's now in the news, you learn from it. You learn, you learn about what do we have to be doing. Without justifying what, what anything he did. What, what is real, the real response, as I said? The response is not as I mentioned, McDonald's and IBM and uh, NASDAQ and so on. The response is that we have something that we also believe in. We believe in the Abraham's approach to faith. We're not talking about, I want to be secular and you want to be pastor. Just don't kill me, I won't kill you. No, we also have a way of understanding that, that, uh, that there's a divine plan, that all people are created equal, inalienable rights, and still we allow for diversity. We allow for different opinions. Why, can, why can't we grow in that way? Why can't it be through love and kindness? Inspire. This is the message. This is the lesson. I don't know what it's going to take to teach the Muslim radicals or the Muslim world that if they did everything that they're doing, but only did it through inspiration. You know, write books. Write articles. Take out, take out space in the New York Times and hammer away, not in, in, in angry terms, in beautiful terms, why it's important to serve God in this world. That is what's called maturity. Now, sadly, I have to look at myself. When I say myself, I mean also myself, my people, and so on. I look at Israel. Israel, chosen land, chosen people, holy land, and the wars that go on there. And you think, say, is, wouldn't it be, make sense that Israel should be the biggest exporter of the divine plan? You don't see that either. And again, I'm not comparing. So we have a ma major vacuum going on here. And who's filling the headlines of the vacuum for religious ideas are, unfortunately, the most radical. That's what happens when there are vacuums. There's an empty space. In Yiddish, they used to say the expression, in a, pust, in a pusta krichtman. In an empty space, all the unwanted crawl. You create a vacuum, nature abhors a vacuum. You create a vacuum, you're creating big trouble. Because it's going to be filled by something. And it may not be filled with what you want to be filled. This is also true in our own lives. When you're bored and you have a vacuum in your life, it's the most dangerous time a person is in. It's even worse than when you have bad influences because the vacuum has energy and power and it's going to get you into trouble if you don't fill it with something healthy. Everyone needs love. What happens when you don't get it in healthy ways? Unfortunately, you get it in very unhealthy ways and that's destructive. It's not neutral. So we have a major vacuum of religious and visionary leadership today. And who's leading and who's taking control? So you may have a bunch of aimless young people now in the Middle East. People who are desperate, they want to fight against the autocrats of their lands, Tunisia, Egypt, Syria. You know, the list goes on. And it's not going to stop. But who's going to fill the vacuum? The most passionate leaders are all religious, and most of them are fortunately radical. You don't have, and I don't like the word moderate either. Moderate sounds like almost, again, tolerant. You don't have powerful, passionate, visionary people like Abraham that can get up and say you pray for infidels without compromising one iota of your integrity. People like Rajbi in the 13th year, wherever you go, repair, fix. You know, here I look at the other way around. I see how many 
people coming from the Muslim world join Harvard and Yale and the best Ivy school, schools, not to learn the ways of America to help bring God here, to learn the ways of America to help destroy later, because Islam has to own and control, which is another discussion which I'm not going to get into right now. So, what shall I say? I'll say it like this. We're in the month two, and time is for intense internal work, and that is critical to be able to own um, spirituality. That's critical, because then once it becomes part of you and part of your refinement, then you earn your way to be able to have the revelation of the third month. So in that sense, number two is greater than number one. Yes, number two is far greater, and it achieves something that God, in a way, himself could never achieve. Because God, before the symptom, before concealing the light, yes, the divine light consumed everything. The expression in Eitz Chaim from the Arizal, the tree of life, he writes, Eiren Sof Chaim Amala Kol The infinite divine light filled all of existence, meaning all of what would become later existence. No room for anything else. But that's not what God wanted. What's the achievement? That, 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 what's the big thing for God to fill all, all the entire presence of everything? He wanted something that, where his presence is not filled, felt. And we should be wise enough to learn how to pierce the veil and introduce it and become partners. So it says, The actions, the work of tzaddikim, maise tzaddikim, again, personal effort, ear, the self-generated work, avoidant, is greater than the creation of heaven and earth. So everyone asks the question, how could you say that? God created heaven and earth from nothing. Yeshmaen ex nihilo, whatever that means. But Yeshmaen, I know the expression in Latin. From nothing. Yeshmaen, from nothing this created something. How could tzaddikim who are taking the world which already exists, how could they be greater? So it says because they take from something and turn it into nothing. They take a something that God created and turn it into nothing. What means nothing? Not nothing as in, in nothing. It means as in selflessness. God created an egotistic, self-interest generating world. And they take a, a selfish world that God created that way by concealing his presence. And they say, no, we will pierce this presence, your, your concealment. We will be more powerful in the divine concealment and the divine crafting of this selfish world, a narcissistic world. And we will be selfless. That is greater than the initial. Because for God to create something, that's God's power. But for us to be able to rewire something that comes from the divine gives us more power. So in that sense, they, month two is even greater than month one. Obviously, the objective is a f total fusion. This isn't a battle between us and God. It's about a partnership. Where Matan Torah becomes, Vayer Hashem al Sinai, God descended. And Moshe, Omar, Alei, and Moses went up. So a total joining, a total fusion of the two. But Matan Torah, Sinai, was just the beginning of the process, of a new chapter. And then thousands of years have passed now, 3,323 years. Much has happened in this, in this period. You know, the world has become more receptive to these ideas. But we still have our battles. We still have people representing or feeling they represent God, and they just don't know how to, co how to integrate it into life on this earth, to integrate modernity and faith. Our response cannot be, go back to your caves. You know, we don't want to hear from you. Don't kill anybody. Or stop being passionate and become secularized and, and become uh, complacent like the rest of us. Our response has to be that there's another stage in development and evolution in human evolution, and that is learn to have a mature relationship with God and a mature relationship with the rest of the human race. Learn that you can inspire, that you can do it with love and kindness. As the beginning of this chapter begins, Emer, God says, speak to the Kohanim. The word in Hebrew, Emer, there's a word, Daber. There's, a, there's other expressions, Sagid. So, um, The Emer, Rashi says, from the Chilta, says that Emer means coming softly. When you speak softly, you use the word Amira. When you speak harshly, you use da Daber or, or Sagid. So it says, speak softly to the, to the, and the parents, Lahazir Hagdele Malaktanim, that the adults should, it says, Lahazir means to warn, but Lahazir also comes from the word Zer Harakia, from to illuminate. Illuminate, radiate, 
Speak softly. That's how you educate. That's how you teach. Not with aggression. You need discipline, but discipline has to be part of love. Discipline has to have humility. So it's a path that's much harder. It's much easier to just burn everything up. It's much easier to tell a child, you did something wrong, you're grounded, you're punished. It's also easier the other way around, just to tolerate everything. The harder path, the, path, the road less traveled, is to say, I love you, but it's not the way to be. To convey love, but to show that the love demands that you be a better person. That takes a lot more work. And we need to learn to do it in our own little world. And obviously, hopefully there will be a leader that will rise. I think if we demand it enough, and maybe if we clamor for it, and we uh, make it an agenda, it can happen. I haven't seen anyone in all the articles talk about this part of it. Because we're all dealing with firefighters. You know, how do you put out the fire? How do you minimize the losses? How do you kill the terrorists? Some of it is necessary. You have to stop the bleeding. Someone's out to get you. You've got to hunt them down. Billions of dollars were spent on this manhunt. And continue to be spent. If they just put a few million dollars in cultivating a few leaders, it may be a preemptively. And you don't do one or without the other. You know, in surgery, you need to stop the blood, the bleeding, but you also need to rehabilitate and build. Well, I think if enough of us demand it, and we ourselves understand the importance of it, maybe things will change. Maybe Israel, like it says at the end of that prophecy, that Zion should be the source of Torah and the word of God coming from Jerusalem. If that was being exported from Israel, a message of how, to, how, how we Jews, the oldest of all the religions, go back almost 4,000 years, how did Abraham want us all to be, all children of Abraham, Jews, Christians, Muslims, for that matter, Buddhists, Hindus, everyone on this earth, if uh, Israel, Jews, did their part, it may make a big difference, as the prophecy also says, that at the end of days, you'll have all the nations will come and call this their house of prayer. And you see, Jerusalem remains the hub, the cortex, vortex, cortex, all the, all the, the center, nerve, the central nervous system of all the religions, and remains that type of hotbed uh, in, uh, in fighting, but also in, uh, in, um, in spirituality. So the ultimate goal is that Jerusalem becomes that type of source of uh, light and harmony and gentleness. So we can go on and on. I have a lot to say on this matter, uh, as you can see. And the main thing is that uh, on one hand, it's uh, maybe some closure, maybe some catharsis for some of the people who have suffered here in New York. Of course, the United States, you know, I know some of the families that have lost uh, husbands and children in the World Trade Center, 9-11. Not that killing bin Laden necessarily brings their children back, but there's something about, about uh, justice. Again, I don't think it's going to solve the problem, but it's part of the ongoing evolution. And hopefully we can be wise and learn to connect the dots and understand the bigger picture emerging out of all of this. And above all, like I said, we have to do our little part, to bring it back to our little world. You change the world right here. You change the world in the steps we do in our own being more gentle and more refined, taking the Omer and seeing it as a, as a challenge, as an opportunity to work on yourself. Find, you know, it's hard to imagine finding all 49, it's hard to refine in one shot. But if you do one or two or three or even one in this 49 day period, something that a weak spot, a weak point that you learn to be aware of and then repair somewhat, that goes a long way because we never know, as I said, what the tipping point is. Ultimately, six billion people on this earth are six billion individuals like us here. Uh, they wouldn't fit into this room, but individuals, they're all one, one by one by one by one. So may we, uh, may you all be blessed. God bless us all to have the wisdom, and we should only know good news. And uh, remember that sometimes number two is greater than number one. And number three, of course, is the ultimate goal to bring us all together here. And uh, with that being said, I will say that any of you, if you're familiar with the Omer book, if you don't mind, lift it up. This is the Omer book I prepared, actually. I did it for this class. It was first handouts before it became a booklet. It wasn't even planned, so if you're interested in it, we have it here available. I also send out, we send out a daily Omer reminder that talks about that uh, the exercise each day, so just let us know your email address. And Philip will be giving his class next, tomorrow, I'm sorry, next day. Um, that's tomorrow. Uh, 
And that is um, Thursday night, 7 p.m. Please speak to him. He's right there. Philip is the guy, the cute guy, uh, sitting there um, with a string, uh, shoelace uh, tie, blue shirt, nice vest, um, whatever you call that casquette on his head. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and the one who's blushing now, right. Yes. Um, just one second. So let me just finish the announcement. So 7 o'clock, Philip will be here next Wednesday. Um, and uh, I'm sorry? We will be. Uh, when I say we, I meant uh, me and my, both my animal soul and my divine soul. That's right. <laughs> both will be here. Yes, and we will run after. Like Philip once said to me, he wants to have two copies of the CD of the class because in case he doesn't like one, he'll listen to the other one. Uh, <laughs> So, um, and it should be a very, we should have, no, you know, hopefully so only good surprises this coming week. As it's been going, there's been surprise per week. <laughs> and it uh, should be positive ones, healthy ones, and, uh, and uh, f f celebrating life, not celebrating death. Let's put it that way. Yes.